Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Kevin McKenna. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, Hello. Kevin. Hi there. We've known each other for some years now because you edited and assisted me with the Quality Street Gang uh, book. When you look back to your Celtic youth, who was your Celtic team? Uh, it would probably be the team immediately after the Lisbon Lions. I began to become familiar with the team as, as the Lions were, were being dismantled. So it was a mixture of the Lions and the likes of Harry Hood, Tommy Callaghan, those sorts of players. So the team that, um, probably the Feyenoord mm. European Cup, Leeds United, Fiorentina, uh, Benfica season, 1970. It's when I remember, remember being aware of what was happening. See, when I, I, I look at that particular season, <coughs> 50 years ago next year, um, and the run that Celtic went on to get to the final, in many ways far more difficult than the run mm. to get to Lisbon. Mm. Um, and the, the European performance, almost season on season for about a decade, Kevin, I mean, uh, to, to start supporting Celtic when we were a true European superpower, how did that feel? How, did, how were the European nights at Celtic Park? Well, it's funny because when you're, when you're very young and, and you get plunged into that, I suppose people of my generation were fortunate have been taken along to see Celtic at a time of unprecedented and almost unbroken success. So you kind of took it for granted, you know, and as, as you became more aware of of their achievements and assessing it against the strength of other clubs and, and countries, you just went along to a European night expecting to win. Mm -hmm. I, I remember I remember the experience of seeing them against Suchpest Roja the second time we played them, which was the season 72 73. Beat them 2 1 at home and we're beating 3 nothing away. Previous season we'd beaten them 2 1 away and drew 1 each at home to go through to the European Cup semi final. So to see a Celtic team in Europe being beaten 3 0, even though it was away from home, even though it was against a very strong Hungarian team, it was a bit of a shock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because prior to that, you've beaten them. In fact, at that point, although Celtic were beginning to decline, I, th I think that, was, that remains their longest winning sequence in Europe. And I think, it, you know, I think it was something like, or unbeaten sequence, starting in um, the previous season. Copenhagen at home, Slema Wanderers home and away, Uzbest Doja home and away, Inter Milan home and away, beating in penalties, Rosenborg home and away, Uzbest Doja home. I don't think, I think that's the longest unbeaten streak Celtic have had in Europe. It's incredible now when you look at how European football um, has developed that you could win the European Cup playing nine games. Mm. I mean, last season Celtic played something like 16 games in Europe to get to the... I mean, that's half a league season mm. almost. It's incredible and, and obviously the players now are making far more European appearances but it's getting more and more difficult to progress. I mean when you were looking at the, the lines breaking up and this crop of youngsters coming through that you and I have spoken about many many times when you look at the players that were coming through, who were the guys that stood out for you as a fan, Kevin? Douglas, McCarry, Connolly, Vic Davidson. Um, you're tempted to put David Hay in there, but for some reason you, you, kinda, you, you see David Hay as somebody maybe a bit older um, because he just always looked more mm -hmm. experienced. But it, but it was that era. And you, you can... Of them, and Paul Wilson, of course, and of them it was Vic Davidson, who, according to Kenny Dalglish, was the most gift, naturally gifted of them all, but he was the one that probably didn't, um, his career didn't do him justice. Um, and, it, and it's quite un interesting that, with, this, with the revisionism that um, football supporters always conduct, there's been... Um, 
delayed inquest as to why the Lisbon Lions were allowed to break up so quickly. And I, and I get that because people like Tommy Gemmel, um, Willie Wallace, Bobby Murdoch were allowed to go to English teams who were and, and you know, lower tier teams who were probably who were paying them bigger money than they were on at the best team in Europe. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you had these this uh, unprecedented in terms of quality group of youngsters who were coming through. So in any generation, that's going to that there's going to be a dilemma given that you only had I think it was only one substitute at the time. Yeah. So you're thinking we need you know we need to keep these young players on side because they they are they're very gifted. But you can't, you know, you can't just say, well, we'll have them in the squad and play them every so often because you only, you only had one substitute and then not long after it was two substitutes mm -hmm. maximum. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dalglish, you mentioned Dalglish, he's <clears throat> an obvious name because of what he went on to achieve. But when, da when Dalglish came into the team, he came in in 68 and then you never saw him for another, another mm -hmm. few seasons. Mm -hmm. And he come in uh, when he was a wee bit older and wiser and they changed his position, very much like McGrain. McGrain was 20 when he made his debut for Celtic. Of course, I met, and I didn't mention Danny McGrain, unforgivably, in that group earlier, of course. I mean, that's, that's seven. Aye, and it's incredible. I mean, Vic Davidson, again, when we were doing the Quality Street Gang book, so many of his teammates spoke about the talent of Davidson. He obviously had a good career, um, but up against so many talented players at Celtic, maybe didn't develop uh, for a period uh, to, get back, to get into that first team and, and hold down a place. Um, but people also talk about disappointment of uh, George Conley's career, even mm. though mm. he achieved so much before the age of 26. When he disappeared, how tragic was that for Celtic? And I remember it was um, the way my, my dad and people of his generation talked about George Conley, it was with reverence. And there was a, a palpable feeling of grief when it became clear to everyone around about 74. 75 that he was beginning to encounter problems and they wouldn't be seeing him again. It was real grief because there was a feeling that of all of those players this was somebody who was genuinely world class and could, could make a difference in, in a game at a top level. And, it, and the other tragic thing about it was that his, his demise happened a, a year after he won the the, foot, the Scottish Player of the Year, nineteen seventy three, mm -hmm. and I and I remember. I mean, I remember also at school, St Ninians and Kirk Matilla, going on an outing, and the head teacher was there, and it was a, a, a radio bulletin on on the bus that George Conley had had missed a, a Scotland game or hadn't turned up, and I remember the head teacher of the school talking about this. This this was news and it was in, and it was just this feeling of disappointment of of that generation that the boy wasn't coming back that there were problems and it wasn't anything like the same scrutiny of people's personal lives then as, as there are now and and because of that there's been quite a lot of conspiracy theories about who knew what and what was happening in the Celtic dressing room and bullying and but. It could be anything. And, you know, Connolly himself has been rehabilitated a bit because a few years ago he began to... He, he re-emerged from the shadows and talked about his alcoholism. Mm. But I don't remember him... I don't remember him confirming or discussing any of the more lurid rumours that were suddenly appeared years later mm -hmm. about what was happening in the Celtic dressing room. It seems even now um, it was a shock, but it was also quite tragic in terms of the fact that Celtic and Scottish football lost one of their finest. Mm. I, I've been watching back on the, the Leeds United games, and some of the stuff he was doing with that ball was incredible, Kevin. You know, in the semi final of the European Cup. Tell me, tell me this: is there does a recording exist of the ninety minutes of both those Leeds United games, Hamden and, and Ellen Road, because. All, all I, the most I've ever seen is like four or five minutes mm -hmm. from UEFA 
and on one of their kind of Champions League highlights um, products and you know a minute or so at Ellen Road but, but the games were or they, they were recorded in their entirety. Yeah, absolutely. And I haven't seen Celtic TV, because a few years ago they were putting on some... I mean, I think they played the, the full game of the final. final. But I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to see those two games. In their entirety. And there's a market for them, because mm -hmm. they, were, they were two of the most iconic games Celtic have ever played. And they were recorded live or as live. And I don't, I don't think any Celtic supporter um, who came after that period has ever seen beyond the goals and mm -hmm. a couple of mm -hmm. a couple of highlights. Was it Dalglish's leaving that convinced you that Celtic were no longer this European superpower? Um, no, probably before then. Um, I remember watching them against a Greek team called Olympiakos Perez. Uh, the season after Atletico Madrid. It was the first round of the European Cup. And uh, it was one each at Celtic Park, I think. I think it was 2 nothing in Greece. And this Greece team, Greek team, they were, they were good, but, you know, they weren't really that good. But they were outstanding against. We were lucky to get a draw at Parkhead. And this is the first round. <clears throat> and so you kind of knew... Then the following season was even worse. We were put out in the quarter-final of the Cup Winners' Cup by Sachin Rink's week out from East Germany. Who I think I'm currently playing in the third tier of Germany. <coughs> Kenny Dobby scored again. In fact, no, was it Paul Wilson that scored against Olympiakos? Anyway, Dobby scored against Sachin Rink and they equalised. But it was, I mean, we should have hammered them four or five nothing and then the second leg was live on television at one of those hours where schools are mm -hmm. agreeing to show it just to make sure nobody's dogging it. And you could tell how hopeless they were. And somehow or other, they they, they won, won nothing. And, and so it's the quarterfinals of the, the Cup Winners' Cup. Celtic should have been in the semis. I don't I remember it wasn't a very... Wasn't a very strong competition. The Cup Winners' Cup was never that strong anyway because it was the kind of least of the three tournaments because very few other countries accorded the same importance to their cup competitions mm. as mm -hmm. Scotland and England did. So it was an opportunity. In fact, I think it was, I think Anderlecht. Yeah, and Anderlecht beat West Ham in the final that season. Mm -hmm. So... That was that was a, a clear opportunity for Celtic to get to at least another European final. And that was it. And then the following season we get dismantled by Vizsla Krakow. And then it, it just began and then the season after that and another very weak Austrian team called um, SSW Innsbruck hammered us in Austria. So that's so that's four seasons in a row we've been put out by a Greek team and a you know not very good East German team, a workman like Polish team, and a fairly weak Austrian team. Four successive seasons. So it became it became clear that the club um, was settling for second best, and and I think probably that's when it became clear to the fans that. We were that the club was in the hands of a, a bunch of incompetents who had got away with it because of the once in a lifetime excellence of the Lisbon Lions, um, but their failure to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are still questions over where all that money that was coming through the the cash turnstiles had gone to but there was the, the, the club had settled to be an also ran in Europe at a time I think where they could have done something um, and and what Aberdeen and Dundee, and Dundee United did then between 1980 and 1985 showed you Celtic 
you know, they, were, they were picking still to be had. This was before massive amounts of television money yeah. began to flow into the top four leagues. So there was still um, you know, clubs who, who looked after their businesses properly and who hired good coaches. There were rewards to be had because there could be an even um, uh, an even split between great players, not so great players to mould into a, a team. Now, of course, no team outside the top four you know, can, can build a proper team because as soon as any promising player uh, emerges, they're, they're immediately snapped up. Make them an offer they just can't refuse. And I mean, the Ajax has been the, the most recent example of that, Kevin. I think when you're looking at that uh, with hindsight, you, you knew watching Celtic that we were being run by incompetence I mean we're selling our best players mm. uh, the quality street kids uh, were sold off McCarry, Hay and then Dalgleish and the Dalgleish one I mean even there I mean I remember vividly the day it was, I think it was the 4th of August 77 I was up, I was climbing the Cabot's Hills with my pal and the word came back on I think it was Radio Clyde we were listening to he's away but we kind of knew that it was happening because I think Celtic had playing in Australia in a four team tournament yeah. that included Red Star Belgrade memory serves and the Australian national team and the least didn't travel. Um and then at the four hundred and forty thousand. Well who, who who thinks that's a so that that was also part of the wider incompetence of the Celtic board that when they actually had a sellable asset they couldn't even get the proper market price for him. And how many Liverpool people have you heard say that was the biggest steal? Exactly. In their his their entire history, mm -hmm. even now, they still can't believe that they managed to get Kendall Gleish, best player in Scotland for a generation, over several years, for less than half a million pounds. I mean, I couldn't argue with them going because he, he went and he's pretty, he went at 26, 27. We get, we get a good six or seven years mm -hmm. out of them. So there's no complaints there. <clears throat> See, when you look at the, the sale of the, at least the previous chaps we've mentioned, but even further back, your Paddy Kerrins, Willie Fernie, we were always selling Bobby Collins the best assets for well, big, big money. Well, if you look at <clears throat> that period between 1954 <clears throat> when Celtic won a double, in 1965, when we won the Scottish Cup, we won two League Cups, Patrick Thistle and then the 7-1 game against Rangers. And I think people looking back at that think, God, that was, must have been a really bad Celtic team. But it wasn't, it was, I mean, when I, I remember doing the, the Celtic Opus and we wanted a section in it, coming up with the 50 best Celtic players and we had like various people sitting on a sort of committee and then got the, this fit and this included former Celtic players, a couple of, um, I think uh, Gordon Strachan was part of this as well, various supporters and the amount of players from that era who were considered to be in the all-time top 50 was incredible. It's interesting. You know, Fernie, of course. Bobby Collins, Bobby Evans, John McPhail, Billy McPhail, um, Bertie Peacock, Bertie so. Peacock, yeah. and uh, so what, what, what was happening? Well, like well, we know what was happening. Robert Kelly was running the show. Robert Kelly, who was a, I mean, people say he was a stockbroker. He wasn't. He was a stockbroker's clerk, and. He wasn't the brightest either, and that man and his family, I think, are singularly responsible for Celtic underachieving at two or three, two periods in their, their, their existence when they should have been doing more. Mm -hmm. But all those, as soon as anyone showed a bit of promise, he was sold. And you have to then start asking, so why? Why were they in such a hurry to sell players as soon as they were good? What happened to the money? Mm. 
did it ever get reinvested? I mean, remember, there's no, next to no financial scrutiny of football clubs then, as was shown a few years later with the, the death of Third Lanark. <coughs> so, it was it was a template, and of course, yeah. I mean, you look at some of the earlier fanzines like the Cell, who who talked about. You know, there were actually demonstrations, there were protests, but they were just brushed off because, again, there was no press scrutiny. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I know the press got a hard time for alleged bias one way or the other and incompetence, but without the, uh, without the press um, these days, and certainly in our case, um, we wouldn't have managed to get rid of the old board. And it was because there wasn't as much press scrutiny in mm -hmm. the 50s and the 60s that the directors could get away with that sort of behaviour. That, you know, those um, failures. Going even into the 80s, when you look at, um, obviously Steen's time came to an end. The one and only man that could have taken over from him takes over, but he eventually leaves because of the board. Mm -hmm. We lose one of the greatest talents we've had for, for a long, long time in Charlie Nicholas. At the time, the board might have sold that story that Charlie wanted to leave. Well, the, the Charlie Nicholas one is, is it annoys me that Celtic fans have been sold, have, have bought into this fiction that he was desperate to leave in 1983. My understanding from several sources including Charlie Nicholas, is that he was happy to stay for another two or three seasons. But Celtic were, you know, Celtic were basically driving him, the, driving, putting him in a taxi and driving him to the airport to get him to London. You know, Celtic wanted him to go because they'd never seen a cheque for 725000 And again, there's not much financial scrutiny what do you do with 725,000? Well, it certainly wasn't put into the team. So that, that's uh, my, my understanding is that he was marched out the door by Celtic, whether he liked it or not. And I think it's unfair on him that this, this fiction has been allowed to grow up and it was fed and watered initially by the Celtic board. So that ability or inability of the Celtic board um, to take something that's good and sell it off to the highest bidder. We found ourselves moving into the late 80s with a stadium which wasn't fit for purpose. Um, and actually when McNeil took over, it looked as though we had a squad that wasn't fit for purpose, Kevin, but Billy McNeil with the centenary year was almost an anomaly in a, in, a, in a number of years where the board completely underperformed. When did it become clear to you in the 1990s that we were at crisis point? Well, we kind of we kind of knew at some point <clears throat> the season after the centenary season. I mean, when when Billy McNeil came in, he made four excellent purchases: Andy Walker, Billy Stark, Chris Morris, Mick McCarthy, and then augmented that with the purchase of Joe Miller, which had everybody buzzing, and it was a lot of money. Um, but then the, the, the following season, you know, there were the two quite heavy defeats by Rangers at Ibrox, and then a heartbreaking defeat at Celtic Park where we missed a penalty. And winning the, winning the cup to stop Rangers winning the treble was, was fine. But it, it became clear, because Frank McAvenny didn't stick around for very long. I forgot about I, Frank McAvenny as well, getting him. So you were left to conclude a few years later that that was money that Celtic were struggling to get together. But they knew they had to come up with something special for the centenary year. Um, but I think um, the impact, the, the psychological impact of Maurice Johnston um, that the Morris Johnson saga is incalculable and the jolt that it must have given 
Rangers, <coughs> um, you know, is is uh, it can only be guessed at as well. And I and I think this kind of depression settled on Celtic. Rangers were were buying players like Oleg Kuznetsov, Mikhail Chenko, you know, genuine world class players. And I mean, there was about thirty odd players at Rangers, but you know, including who who was the wee winger from Norwich that they got? It's a Dale Gordon, cracking wee player, mm -hmm. big David, money as well. David Robertson, the Aberdeen mm -hmm. fullback. Um, there was a guy called Mel Sterling. Was it Mel Sterling? That's right, hey. Excellent player. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's before you get to your. Trevor Stevens, Gary Stevens, Paul Gascoigne, Loudrup. I Hately was a Hately was a magnificent player for mm -hmm. them. I you know he he was he was like a line out. I mean put the the, 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 the rivalry aside, but God Hately was some player mm -hmm. in full cry who didn't complain when he got hit and relished a physical battle. Celtic had no chance and we didn't have any strategy to deal with it. I mean, the, the old board will say now that, well, because of what's happened to Rangers, that they they had no chance because the Rangers were, were paying money they didn't have. Um, but with Celtic, there was, that, that doesn't, that doesn't address the fact that um, between 89 and 95, we didn't win a thing. Couldn't even beat Wraith Rovers in the League Cup final. Getting put out by Airdrie and Falkirk in successive seasons in League Cup. First round defeat against Motherwell. Getting hammered 5-1 by Neustadt Zamax. Um, I mean, the partisan Belgrade fiasco, that was another landmark and it was, I think, gave us a bit of a psychological blow. Um, and so, so there was all those things that had, you know, yeah, Rangers had money they were spending, um, which, which was probably on the never, never, but there were 18 trophies to win. And we never, we hardly got a sniff at any of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, it wasn't Rangers that was putting us out because cause we actually had a very good cup record against Rangers in that period. Graeme Souness and Walter Smith Rangers had a fairly patchy record in the Scottish Cup. Um, it, it was, you know, it was um, Motherwell's, Airdrie's, Falkirk's that were putting us out. Wraith Rovers in the final. Falkirk in 87, mm -hmm. you know, no excuses. No, absolutely the, amount, not. the sort of players that we were getting in were just, you know, I mean, okay, Raphael, shite, is one thing, but he was just a symptom of a greater malaise. There were some shocking footballers. And then, and the, 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 the kind of casualties there were the likes of Paul McStay, who, who's Best years, unfortunately, were in a bad Celtic team. And then you had great wee uncut diamonds like Andy Payton. I saw him on social media recently, and I think he seemed taken aback by how fondly he was regarded by people at us that actually saw him because he worked his socks off for Celtic, scored some cracking goals. Mm -hmm. but in, in a very, very difficult period for yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Andy Payton. Always, you know, did a job for us. Likewise, in a slightly later era, Pat McGinley. Twelve goals from midfield in any mm -hmm. year is good, but in a team like that, excellent. But Tommy Burns couldn't wait to get him out of the door because he, he wanted money for um, uh, for a dorm. Mm -hmm. God rest him. Uh, yeah, just just 
errors of judgment, incompetence, all the way down the line, and Rangers filled their boots. Um, you know, when people talk about comparing the merits of the Celtic nine in a row team and the Rangers nine in a row team, the one, the one fact that shines out is that in Celtic's nine in a row season uh, era, Rangers, they had to overcome a, a very, very good Rangers team who who won a European trophy, were runners-up in another European trophy, you know, had some superb footballers, um, and also, for three or four years, very good Hibs teams and very good Aberdeen teams. Yes. When Rangers won the nine in a row, they were, they were up against a Celtic team that has never been weaker. Now, I'm not saying that Rangers didn't have a good team, or that they didn't deserve to win that nine in a row. They had some excellent players, but... My God, we made it easy for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That board made it easy for them. See, when you look at McCann and the way that he um, was able to not only save the club but build the club since the takeover, do you see comparisons between him and the way that Lowell runs Celtic? Um, well, it was diff- It was different. I think. I think McCann. McCann was under. The pressure McCann was under was incredible. And Lowell said nothing like that. Um, because McCann was, was being asked to come up with a, a former club within two years that was capable of stopping Rangers winning 10 titles in a row or just winning a league any, any time. But he also knew that the, the club was in a far worse state financially and far closer to collapse than probably he had thought when he first got involved in the enterprise. Um, and also the press, because there were certain individuals associated with the old board and one or two rivals of McCann afterwards who leveraged anti McCann coverage for their own personal vindictive ends so you'd all that going on and it would have been easy for McCann to say right we're going to just go and get a couple of big um, vanity purchases uh, you know to, to make it look like we're really taking this seriously but at the back of his mind he's thinking that'd be if Celtic go out of business because we tried to stop Rangers winning 10 titles. That has, that's far, that's a calamity, obviously. So the fact that he resisted the all the pressure to do that, when only he knew how bad, you know, how much Celtic had been run into the ground by the previous board, um, was astonishing. Peter Rawwell, it's different because I think that um, there's much more. There seem there seems to be much more um, concern about shareholder value and their duties to shareholders. Um, and he he gets the sort of. I mean, Peter does a good job as a chief executive, but Celtic are a small to medium enterprise, an SME. They have fewer than five hundred employees. The average salary for a Chief executive of an SME in Scotland is about two hundred grand. Pierre picks up, including bonuses, almost you know ten times that. Um, and I, I hate it when he or others associated with Celtic talk about shareholder value and the fiduciary duty to the shareholders. Well, does the does the the amount of money paid in by supporters? purchasing merchandise then you know they not okay they might not appear on the um, the list of shareholders but it's, you know they've got their expectations as well I think two of the biggest issues the Celtic support has with Peter Lowell is missing out on John McGinn which has turned into a bit of a, a shocking decision mm-hmm. and losing Kieran Tierney would mm-hmm. you agree with that? Um, yeah mainly I suppose I don't think I think you uh, you can't overestimate the 
the paranoia that the current custodians of the club, including Peter Lawwell, have, have it never ever been in the situation we were in in 1993, 1994, um, and perhaps erring on the side of caution when it comes to spending money, and I get that. Nevertheless, not getting John McGinn when we could have um, was a serious error of judgment because he will be a world-class player, a Scotland captain, and will be playing for either a top four club in England, Spain, Italy, anywhere he chooses. Um, the only upside to that, I suppose, is that I, I, I wonder if Charlie Christie would have been given his extended run in the team and his breakthrough period last season if we'd got John McGinn, but who knows. Um, the other big error, I think, is the amount of time we've known that we needed uh, an out-and-out left-back, and we haven't got one. And Bolling Goalie isn't an out-and-out left-back. We don't, we, we don't want anything flashy. I mean, like a, a Lee Naylor type, mm -hmm. who just knows the position, can mark a player and he's fit, knows what he do when a ball comes into the box when Celtic are under attack. That's, that's all. We're not looking for somebody who can, you know, play brilliant 40 yard um, passes and we'll not get another Kieran Tierney, you know, who's got that superhuman lung strength. And why, you know, £10 million pounds we've spent. We've spent £10 million in two players to play in the sort of game that we played against the same sort of opponents as Clues, third round qualifiers. They weren't there. Don't know what's going on. I mean, you also have to temper this with the fact that there's so much that will happen behind the scenes and in the politics of big football clubs, including Celtic, that we'll never ever be party to. And Celtic aren't exactly the greatest at communicating anyway. You know, we, we all love to think we're kind of left to centre, lefty, liberal socialists, but we basically follow a club which adheres to uh, you know, like a, a, a 19th century capitalist doctrine and it's got more Tories in it on its board than the 1922 committee. But that's, that's, that's our choice. We kind of know that. We just suck it up and they know we will because there's something else going on. But we're basically... But then football fans turn into fascists, you know, think nothing of slaughtering somebody for four bad days at the office, having him sacked. Whereas if the same thing happened to us in our own places of work, you know, we'd be going nuts. But that's that's the nature of football fans. Well, Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on A Celtic State of Mind. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you.